So in the previous couple of videos, we looked at different techniques for creating, keeping track of, and destroying static mesh actors that were external to the blueprint. In this video, I wanna take a look at working with components, which are gonna be internal to the blueprint. So we can kind of ignore this stuff for now. I'm gonna head over to the viewport. So I also mentioned instant static meshes. We're gonna get to that a little later. For now, I'm just gonna stick to static mesh components. The difference at this point is not super important for you. Just uh, follow along. So I'm gonna click this little add button here. And I'm gonna type in the word sphere and select sphere. We'll let it load in. So I now have a static mesh component. You can see there in the parentheses and it is a sphere, right? So you can modify the static mesh, you can change the material, any of those kinds of things. So what I wanna do is I wanna actually add some blueprint logic that will procedurally add spheres and then update the transform so that they're random. Basically the exact same thing that we had before, except all of these static mesh components will be internal components to the blueprint, which means when I move the blueprint, they will move with it. So we can go ahead and delete this one. And for this work, I'm gonna be doing it in the construction script. First thing we'll do is add a for loop. I'll set the range to 100. Off of loop body, I'm going to type in add static mesh component. And this static mesh component object is the same as this static mesh component. So it has a set static mesh method. Pull off from the object so I have the context. Here's our set static mesh. Go to the content browser and select the sphere. Plug that in there. So if I come over to my level and I compile, I'm now gonna get 100 spheres here located at the location of the blueprint. And if I move this around, you can see that they are following the location of the blueprint. And I'm not getting any extra actors here in the world. It's all embedded here in the blueprint. It can be a little bit hard to see because they're all in the exact same spot. Now we're not getting an issue based on the transform not existing because it's just inheriting whatever the transform of the actor is. But I can set a relative transform that will randomize the positions if I want. So let's go ahead and do that. I can actually grab this exact same information. I'm gonna make a transform. And split the struct pin. And then pipe this into X. Control C, Control V to copy and paste. And then pipe that into Y. And now when I compile, I'm going to get a whole bunch of spheres. And they're randomly oriented around the location of the blueprint actor. And if I move it, every time I do anything to this actor here, it's going to rerun its compile script. So the positions are going to randomly update on our spheres. So we looked at how to expose events on the blueprint over here in the previous videos. Let me go ahead and turn those off actually. You can also expose parameters, these variables here. First one we'll expose will be boundary. And the way that you do it is you click this little icon here and you can see that it is now an open eye. So if I hit compile there, I now have my boundary and I can update that. And you can see we can change the distribution here of our spheres. I can also add a new one here. I'm gonna go ahead and add one called count. Set the data type to integer. Compile. And then rather than piping in 100 here, I will just get our count variable. And we can set the default here to 100. Compile and save. Oh, and I need to turn on the eyeball there. And so now I can change the count if I want to, right? All right, and the cool thing about this is each blueprint is going to be uh, unique, right? So you can have different values. You can have the same logic. I'll just duplicate this guy here. So in this one, I'll make it 500 and 500. Right? So they're not dependent. You can have a zillion of these different blueprint actors in the level and each one can have its own settings depending on whatever its specific values are. 
There's a few more things I'd like to show. What I want to do is add some logic to this blueprint so that as we are generating the spheres, we're checking against the other spheres to make sure that we don't have any overlaps. So the way that we're going to do that is we're going to store the transform data, and then we're going to propose a new transform and then check against all of the existing transforms. And if we're a valid distance uh, so that we don't have any intersections, we'll generate the sphere and then add that sphere's transform to our master list. So let's take a look at how to do that. The first thing we want to do is disconnect our add static mesh component and set static mesh nodes because we're not going to be doing that until we have executed some logic. We need to create a transform array so that we can store the transform data for each sphere that we ultimately create. So I'm going to go ahead and create a variable called transforms. The data type is transform and it is going to be an array. I'm going to do a get here, and then off of the array icon, I'm going to create a for each loop. And this will give us the ability to iterate over all, all the transforms that are stored in here. So I'm going to connect that here to my loop body. So for every sphere I try to create, I'm going to iterate over every single transform that exists for every existing sphere. So now I've got this transform and this transform. I need to get the location data. So I will break this one and I will break this one. And then once I've got the locations, I can get the distance between these two locations using a distance vector node like this. So this is going to generate a float value, which I need to store. I need to store all the float values for this calculation here. And then once I'm done, I can pull off here and then essentially get the minimum value, the smallest distance that we generated, and confirm that it is above our minimum value of 100. The reason we're using 100 is because the spheres by default have a radius or a diameter of 100. So the center points of each one need to be at least 100 units apart so that we don't have any intersections there. So I'm going to create another array. This is going to be a float array. I will select get here, and then I'm going to type in add. Once we have evaluated all of the existing transforms against our proposed transform, this pin will fire. So we want to go ahead and grab our distances array. And then I'm going to get the minimum value, min of float array. This is going to generate two things. It's going to be the actual minimum value and then the index of that min. We don't really care about the index. We're really only looking at the min value. I'm going to pull off of this and I'm going to say create a greater than node. Let me get this stuff out of the way. So we just want to confirm that the minimum value is at least greater than 100. This will give us access to a Boolean, which we can plug into a branch. And if this evaluates as true, we'll go ahead and create our static mesh component. So there are a couple little gotchas that we need to deal with before we can actually run this code. Uh, the first one is every time we ping this node here. Oh, uh, there's one more thing I got to do. Right? Plug this in like that. So it has the right transform. So every time we hit this, we're actually going to be generating a different transform. So this is going to get one transform, and then this is going to get another transform because this one is kind of being pinged by this node and this one is being pinged by this node. And we have random nodes here that are generating data randomly whenever th this gets hit by another node. So what we need to do is we actually need to store this data for the for loop. Right, because we're going to be generating one proposed transform per loop here. So I'm going to go ahead and create another variable called test transform. And this is just a regular old transform, not an array. And we want to set it right here.
and we will set it with this data, right? I'm going to make myself a little bit of space. So we want to grab our test transform. We'll use get and pipe this in here. And then over here as well. So this will alleviate the issue of getting different transform data as we move through our logic, which would be very, very difficult to keep track of. There's another issue, which is that we need to have at least one transform in here in order to have one value that we can check against down here, right? So if we never add something, this will never evaluate as true because this distance array will always be zero. So we need to throw in at least one transform, and I am going to use the location of the blueprint as our first bit of data here in our transform. So we can get the transforms array. I'm going to right click out here and type in the word self. And then because the self is an actor, I can get the location. We want get actor, sorry, I'm actually gonna use the transform. Get actor transform. We can throw an add in here. Like that. If we are successful in our operation, then we're going to want to store the transform data that we have generated by adding our test transform to our transforms array. Like so. And then finally, we need to clear our distances array every time we try a new location, every time we generate a new transform, because this data is only relevant to the specific test transform that we're creating. So we can very easily do that by clearing the array. Go ahead and scoot this over a little bit. We'll get our distances array. Pull off and type in the word clear. It'll give us a clear node, and we can just pipe that in right here. All right, let's take a look. We'll do a quick compile. And there you go. Let's, uh, let's add a few more and see what happens. So we're going to eventually eventually run into an error. You may see it. I don't think we're going to hit it with this view, but it, you'll see an iteration error if you try to push it really high. But um, we'll talk about how to deal with that a little bit later. Okay, so anyway, that is the process for creating a little bit of logic so that we are storing a test transform, evaluating the test transform against our existing transforms. And if it is successful, we go ahead and create our static mesh component and we store that transform. And if it's not successful, we just skip it. And so that's how we can end up with this result where we have no intersections of any spheres, which is pretty cool. If you'd like a little extra credit, try to add some logic so that you can randomize the scale of these while preventing any collisions. Next up, we're going to talk about editor utilities.